Lord Jesus, thank you that we can gather, that we can spend a few minutes in the Word, and we can look at this story, this narrative, this picture of Saul of Tarsus as he has become a believer and becomes accepted and incorporated into the local church. Lord, in this little sort of background story, I pray that we would um, see how we should be a local church and how we should incorporate others. Help us to listen to your word and to listen to the spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, the, the most royal or the most noble art, uh, order of the garter, the most noble order of the garter. It's an English um, order. It's an English group. It's a group of knights who is probably the most exclusive club in the world. It, it, it began in, uh, at, in no later than 1348, right? So this goes back quite a ways. Uh, the British king Edward III founded this society. It's an incredibly elite society. It's nobody but royals and knights, right? You, you're not getting in, and neither am I, right? Um, here's how exclusive it is. Uh, it, involve, it, it, it includes um, the reigning monarch, so in this case, uh, Elizabeth. So it includes the reigning British monarch. It includes the Prince of Wales. And it includes no more than 24 other people. Like, that's it. Now, there are some... There are some other parts of it that are more honorary in nature, but they're not really part of it, right? It's, the king or the queen is the only one who has the right to name new members to this order. And that only happens when a member of the order of the garter either dies or has disgraced themselves or the order in such a way that they are removed from it, right? That's the only... And then the king or the queen can name someone else. It's included... And currently includes uh, former prime ministers like John Major is uh, is in it. There are military leaders, there are bankers and businessmen and philanthropists who have been knighted by the Queen. Like I said, they're not taking applications, right? You're not. You know what I mean? We're we're not going to make the cut for this incredibly elite group. But what has happened is many times in the local church, we start to see ourselves a little bit like that. As some kind of an elite group where if you'll meet the right qualifications or if you will, um, right, if you, if you will get your life in a certain order or if you will give a certain way or whatever that is, that it's an exclusive club for people that we could call religious royals or spiritual snobs. But here's the thing about the local church as Jesus instituted it and as it developed in Acts chapter 2. Here's the thing about the local church is it's not restricted to the most pious among us. It is not restricted to those who have become most perfect. In fact, we should be less like a country club and more like a walk-in clinic, right? Where whatever it is that you've got, bring it. And, and we'll, we'll help you figure that out and work through that. That ought to be the way we view the local church. Acts chapter 9, uh, we get a little bit of a glimpse. It's, it's kind of like a... Um, when, you look at the, when you look at Acts chapter 9, and the main part of this story we've already covered, which is Saul's conversion to Christianity, there's the Damascus Road experience, right? And then there's Ananias goes to him and, 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 and lays hands on him and he recovers his sight, the scales fall from his eyes, he recovers his sight and he receives the Holy Spirit that, and is baptized. That's kind of the core of the story in Acts chapter 9. That's the painting, right? If you look at it like a piece of art. But you know how sometimes in a piece of art, in a painting, there's some kind of detail maybe in the background. Like a hidden in plain sight kind of thing, right? Where you may not even see it. You look at this painting time and again, and, not, and then one day something happens, right? And you just, where did that come from? And I'll tell you where this came from for me. As I was reading and studying this uh, this chapter, chapter nine, figuring out where do I break it off, you know, for this next section that we study, and what does this mean, and what do we focus on? 
we had our conversation last Sunday night as we began our talk through uh, that book, Autopsy of the Deceased Church by Tom Rainer. And um, there was something that was said, and it wasn't a major part of our conversation. It came up a couple of times, but it wasn't like it wasn't like the bulk of our time. But it but it struck me as I was reading this, and then some other some other commentary I was reading along the way of how we have treated not just us at New Beginnings, but local churches have treated people who are new to the faith or new to the local church at least versus how we should often treat them. Giving people a place at the table, right? And, and hearing hearing from those who, who, who are new either in their faith or new to this local congregation. And we can learn from this church at Damascus, which is not, this isn't the Jerusalem church, right? We all... You read the Acts, you read the New Testament, you hear about the Jerusalem church, and, and you and the other books, right? I read from the book of Galatians earlier, right? That was written to the church at Galatia. Colossians was written to the church at Colossae. Thessalonians was written to the church at Thessalonica. Like these are all these are all pretty prominent Ephesians and Ephesus, right? These are well known and prominent places. We're aware of those churches and what was going on. Damascus we don't know a whole lot about the church in Damascus. Here's what we know. We know that Saul of Tarsus was on his way to persecute Christians at Damascus and Jesus appeared to him and he saved him and he sent him to go on to Damascus where he was welcomed by that church. Now hesitantly to some degree but welcomed nonetheless by that church at Damascus. Here's what we know about the church of Damascus. Most of the New Testament letters that were written to churches are addressing some kind of problem. Now, I'm not saying there were no problems in Damascus, but I know there's not a letter written to them. I mean, you take that for whatever. <laughs> take it, with. it was not a perfect church, but here's something that they did well. I think we can learn from them. The text that we're going to read, the early church, it, it, the text speaks to us, I think, here at New Beginnings about the role of in the local church, our role in the local church, and the role of people as they enter the church, as we as they want to become part of us, the role that they can have in new beginnings, their 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 identity as they enter the family of God, as they enter the fellowship of our church. I think the passage teaches us we are called to belong. Called to belong. So let's read this. Um, Aaron, if you'll take care of these. Acts chapter 9, again, verse 20. Actually, the, the, the last, this is the last part of verse 19. It's just help set part of the context. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name, this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night, lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Now, there's a lot of interesting little things in this text that we could that we could talk about and spend some time on. I want to focus on this idea of, of, of belonging to the local church and why it's important for us as church members or as more mature believers to be welcoming and accepting of younger believers or of new church members. And we, we give lip services. We say we want this. Right? I don't think there's anybody in the room who would say, no, 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 we don't want that. Like, we all want that. We all, I think we genuinely want it. But where we need to be careful and guard ourselves is to act like we want it. Like to not just, not just actions that lead to that, but once it happens, as we interact with people who, who come into the church, who become part of or want to become part of our local body here. I think the Lord wants to send people to us because I think He wants to send people 
to any church that preaches the gospel and that loves one another and that doesn't doesn't live in conflict with each other and and that wants the good of their community, right? I think the Lord wants to send people to all of those churches. And, and I think that describes us. I mean, I think we do want the good of our community. And I do think we get along good. We don't fight. We're in fellowship together. And we do love the Lord. And we do preach the gospel. I mean, I think we want those things. And I think the Lord wants that for us. So as He sends people our way, that we need to uh, we need to be very clear that new people and new Christians need to be accepted into our family. Right? This is part of it. We have to be accepted. One of the analogies that's often used for the church is that of a family. Now we're a large family, right? I mean, that's what families are, right? We get together and we have this reunion every weekend, and we uh, every so often we get together and we eat a meal together, and we. Um, the things that we have in common, we celebrate that. And the things where we are different, we talk about those things, right? I mean, this is what families do. This is what we do. In fact, sometimes there's this song that we sing uh, called The Family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. We read this uh, text in Galatians where Paul talks about his conversion, his time that he went to Arabia. Later in that book, he refers to the church as the household of faith. I think that's a great picture. So in Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus is born again. We find that the church welcomes him into the family. Verse 19 says that after Paul was baptized, that he stayed with the disciples which were at Damascus. The early church reminds us that our spiritual family ought to be a a growing family, not just numerically growing, but growing in health, growing in relationship to each other, growing in the things that we have in common. We have to be willing to accept our family or into our family, those that the Lord brings to us. I think there are some things that these believers in Damascus teach us about this. One of those is we have to accept people regardless of their past. Now this is hard for us sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it is, right? We, somebody comes in, they don't look like us, or they don't dress like us, or they're, they're not as clean as, as we are, whatever it is, right? I mean, they, there's a, we, we worry about people's past. Earlier in Acts, a chapter ago, in Acts 8, verse 3, it says, Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. That was his job. It was his career. And he was passionate about it. It was important to him. This was the baggage that Saul carried into his conversion experience. Now, a lot of us have been saved for quite a long time. And it's easy to forget maybe the baggage that we carry into our conversion experience. Maybe you haven't been saved quite as long, right? And that's a little fresher in your mind. Or maybe even as a believer, there are some habits or some some things that you've done or that you regret and you've gotten forgiveness for, right? You've repented, you've confessed or repented. You, you know that Jesus is forgiving of those things, but that is still baggage in your life. Paul knows about this. Here's a man that um, had been the church's number one enemy and now he's a member. But that's a turnaround. He came to Damascus to arrest Christians and now he's worshiping with those same ones. One of the most intimate things we do in the local church, right, are, are the things we call the ordinances. And we, we celebrate those. One of those is baptism, right? This where you get in the water before people. And the other is this thing that we do together that I talked about during our announcements, and it's receiving communion. It's this moment where we all are, are reflecting on the same thing, this shared experience. But that's a deeply personal thing. We guard that. When we, when we receive communion, right, we, we talk about this, that you need to examine yourself, and if you're not right with God, you don't need to do this. But if you are, if you're a believer, 
and, and your conscience is clear and you are forgiven, we want you to do this with us. And Paul, Saul, in Damascus with the church is doing this. Shouldn't that, shouldn't, isn't that a picture of how it ought to be? 1 John 1 tells us that the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. That means that the family of God, the church, is not limited to people who are highbrow, who are respectable sinners with, with things like gossip and lying or covetousness, right? Those are acceptable sins. The, the church is made up of that, but it's made up of so much more people who are struggling or have struggled with drugs and alcohol, sexual issues. Maybe violence. Terrible, painful pasts. This is where we can bring that. We can lay them at the foot of the cross together. We can find healing with one another. That's why we welcome people regardless of the past. Because you were welcomed regardless of your past. Saul, who we know later as Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, he lists this, this, this group of sinners who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Right? He, there's this list of things and they're not pretty. But verse 11, as powerful as that list is in the negative sense, verse 11 is where the real power is. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says this, and that is what some of you were. I don't know if you know this about the English language. Were is an interesting word. It's a past Tense, right? I'm not a real smart guy, right? I struggle with language. But past tense means not now and not anymore, right? It's the past. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You know, there's a lot of companies that do background checks on prospective employees and people have things on their record that prevent them from getting jobs. And that's a, it's a difficult situation. I, I sympathize with that, but Regardless of somebody's background, finding a church family should never be a struggle. We should accept people into our family regardless of the background. But also, we should do that in response to their profession. Saul, that's all he had going for him was his profession of faith, his story, his testimony that, look, Jesus has done this in me. Ananias heard uh, heard heard that the Lord wanted him to go and speak to Saul and, and he was hesitant to do so. Verse 13, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to the saints of Jerusalem. And the Lord told Ananias, go. God told Ananias, he's my chosen vessel. He's going to be, uh, he's going to bear my name the Gentiles and to their rulers as well as to God's children, as to the children of Israel. It was obvious that the Lord had done something in Saul. Verse 17, Ananias went and he entered the house. Remember the first words he said when he put his hands on Saul. Brother Saul. He accepted him based on his profession. He accepted, look, you say you turn to Jesus, I'm going to... Uh, until you prove it otherwise, I'm going to, I'm going to accept that. That's, that was Ananias' attitude, I think. Ananias called him brother. Saul, um, uh, one, one commentator I read said, Saul had been a bother to the church, and now in his profession of faith, he was a brother. I think that's an interesting <coughs> turnaround, isn't it? It's fascinating to me. See, when a person has been saved by grace and professes their faith in Jesus Christ, we accept them based on that profession. It really ought to be more or less that simple. We don't have to require them to know all the books of the Bible or to recite from memory, you know, the doctrinal statement out of the, what's our little book called, the Treatise of the Faith and Practices of the National Association of Free Will Baptists. Right? We don't have to require, that's a, that's a handle, isn't it? Right? You, I have trouble memorizing the name, much less the list of things in it. Right? We don't require those kind of details to receive you into the church. We require you to make a, a, an honest, legitimate profession of faith that you love Jesus and you've trusted in Him and He has forgiven you. 
Saul, this persecutor, was baptized and accepted into the same family that he had set out to destroy. And this was a real testimony to God's grace. It's a real testimony to the love of God's people. <coughs> There's a church sign I read about somewhere. It said, uh, church, one place where you aren't too bad to come in nor too good to stay out. <laughs> Can we be that place? Where anybody's welcome, you'll just you'll trust in Jesus. We'll you come in and we'll teach you the rest. Right? That's we should have open arms of fellowship for new folks. Welcome into the family. But new folks also need to be applied to the ministry. We don't just need to bring them in. What do we do? Here's the hang up, right? We want new folks to come in. We don't have a big problem with that. It's giving, it's, it's giving them a place that's hard for us. That's a difficult thing. In, in our text, you know, verse 19, we're told that Saul was with the disciples in Damascus. And then in 20, it says, he at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now think about this for a second. Paul joined the church and then he immediately started participating in the work of evangelism. It doesn't doesn't say real specifically, but I, I've got to believe that he did not do this by himself. Right? He probably had partners who went with him to do this. We, we know that Paul believed in that as a principle because we know later in the book of Acts as he makes these missionary journeys and plants churches around, there's Paul. And we always think about Paul with a partner, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, right? It's Paul often, almost always had a partner and even there's a, he, he trained up Aquila and Priscilla. I mean, we get, there's all of these people that Paul partners with. So I've got to believe that from day one, this was part of how he did his evangelistic ministry. He partnered with people. This is why, and we hold that as a value here. We talked about this the other night, right? You want to do ministry here? We want you to do that. Let's talk about what that ministry is going to be. Is it a good fit for who we are and, and the things we want to accomplish? Great. How, uh, do we have a plan? Super, let's do that. Job one, find a partner. You find a partner, and you can do ministry at New Beginnings. I, I really mean that. Because, first of all, nobody does ministry alone. It is too hard, and it's too discouraging. So find a partner, like the church. Find a partner in the church. Find a partner to do the work of the church. I think people often, new people often feel they're locked out of the ministry. That they're overlooked. I think this, this early church in Damascus encourages us to open up opportunities of service. A couple of reasons I think we uh, should apply new people to the ministry of the church. The first is about the, ministry, or the testimony they can give. Nobody is as excited about their church and about Jesus as people who are new to their church or to Jesus. Right? That's just that's just typically the way it is, right? People who have, are recently forgiven, they are excited about that. They want to share that. They have a new, fresh testimony. Help them find ways to share that. Get that out. People who are new to the church are excited about the church. They, they want to be part, and they want to sort of sink their teeth in, and they want to help it grow, and they want to help it advance, right? So let's look for ways to help them do that. Because their testimony is powerful. Verse 20 says that Paul's sermons were simple. He preached in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. He kept it a pretty basic message. You know, I, I was reading an article about Billy Graham uh, recently who, who pastored a church for a short period of time, but he was not a pastor by any large. He was an evangelist. And he traveled the world, right? He preached to more people than anybody else, quite likely. And um, it was said over and over in this article his, that he had been accused of his sermons being simplistic. They weren't simplistic, they were simple. <clears throat> There's a very big difference, right? They were just a simple gospel message. Even, even the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who preached on virtually the entire Bible over the course of his pastorate, um, talked about uh, when he preaches from a particular text, you read the text and you exposit the text making a beeline for the cross, right? You preach the gospel of Jesus. He, he, Saul did this. He preached in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now Saul's education was strong, but his Christian education 
was incredibly limited. Like he didn't have it, right? He had spent a few days with the disciples there, but that was it. God's going to carry him off into Arabia. And it's there that this future apostle to the Gentiles receives instruction from Jesus firsthand. <clears throat> but in spite of this, verse 21 says, All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem alone? Those who call on this name. Hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners of the chief priest? I would imagine that it was standing room only in the synagogue of Damascus. So, first of all, this is a spectacle to see. Right? The guy came in to persecute, to arrest, and maybe even kill believers in Jesus. And now, for some unexplainable reason to most people, he's in front of the room talking about this Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is Lord, He's the Son of God. Everybody's interested in hearing what happened to Him. And I suspect in those early days, He shared that story quite a bit, that story of the blinding light and the voice and getting knocked off His arm, all those things, right? I suspect that that story came out quite a lot. Everybody wanted to hear that. And I'm going to tell you, if the church had held him back, I think that would have been wrong and it would have been foolish. And I think if you want to share your testimony, we're not going to hold you back. You tell the way you came to Jesus. Tell the way Jesus revealed himself to you. Tell the story of you coming to Christ. Tell the stories of the things God has done in your life. Tell those things. The author and professor, Tony Campolo, I uh, used to tell the story of an experience he had. He was serving as a counselor at a junior high youth camp. And there's a little boy named Billy who had a, a cerebral palsy. And many of the kids uh, mocked Billy and made fun of his disability. And, and what they intended to be a joke, right? They elected Billy to give a devotion in front of the whole camp. They sought to embarrass him, right? That's beautiful. So Campolo says he remembers Billy sort of lumbering his way up to the front. Once he began to speak, it took him literally seven minutes to, or several minutes to say just seven words. And Billy said, he stammered out the words, Jesus loves me, and I love Jesus. And that's, it took him several minutes to just stammer that out. And by the time he finished that simple sentence, there were kids in the room who were just weeping. Right? Because in spite of the pain that they intended to inflict on this kid, his testimony was clear. It was simple. And he understood that Jesus loved him more than these kids disliked him. Campolo says that they had brought some of the greatest speakers in the world to that camp. But it was Billy's simple testimony that impacted those kids for Jesus. Christians, new Christians, new church members may not speak with you know, the same church lingo that we all do. They may not understand all the things, the way we do things. They don't all know all the songs and all that. That's okay. It's their testimony. It's usually powerful. You have to allow them to work in the ministry. <coughs> do that because of the testimony, but also because of the training that they get through that. Verse 22 says, Saul grew more and more powerful. By the way, that more and more powerful, that's the idea he was becoming stronger. It's not the way we think of a leader becoming more powerful and controlling, right? It's not controlling, it is literally strength. He, he's being strengthened. His, his, his witness is stronger. His ministry is stronger. His message becomes stronger. It baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. If we never let new people step up and participate in the work of ministry, they'll never learn what it is to serve Jesus. And they'll never grow in the use of their spiritual gifts. What is your spiritual gift? What are you gifted at? What, are you, what has the Lord given you? Now, there's talents and abilities and there's spiritual gifts, and often those overlap. What are you passionate about? In fact, I think often spiritual giftedness kind of falls in that intersection. Not always, but often in that intersection of 
things we are gifted and talented at and the things we're passionate about. And somewhere where those meet is often where your spiritual gift lies. Pursue that. And if you don't know what that is, we'll help you figure that out. And once you figure that out, you want to do something with that here, we'll help you figure that out too. Right? I want that for you. I want that for us. When we incorporate the wider body of Christ in the ministry, it's not only good for the ones being ministered to, it's good for the ones doing ministry. We learn, we grow, and we mature through service. I'm going to tell you a real life example of this right now in our midst is Will doing some preaching, right? That it means the world to me because one, I get a little relief now and then, but also um, he does a good job. It's good for us to hear him preach. But listen, it's good for him to preach. It's good for him to do the work, the study, the research, the the contemplating, meditating on the Word of God. But it's also good for him to stand up in front of people and to proclaim that and to, to hone those skills. It's good for us and it's good for him, right? This is the way ministry works. We want you to be engaged in doing ministry, not just uh, for our benefit, but for yours. Not just for your benefit, but for ours. It's a great relationship. When Reagan uh, ran for his second term as president, there were a number of people who argued that he was too old. He was 73. He was too old to run to be president. And, and in one of the debates with his opponent, uh, Walter Mondale Reagan, said, I'm not going to inject the issue of age into the campaign. I'm not going to exploit for political gain my opponent's youth and inexperience. Right? We, we often look down on folks who are new to the church or new believers. Youth and inexperience should not disqualify I mean, part of the ministry of the church. I think as soon as possible, we get people into the work for our sake and for their sake. Not only do we accept people into our family and, and put them in ministry, we also, uh, I mean, people need to be assisted on their journey. They need to be helped along and encouraged. Verse 23 says that the Jews were angry about Saul's conversion, right? He was on their side, and then he wasn't. They were angry about his conversion. So they decided they were going to try to kill him. That's what we do to people who serve Jesus, right? We kill them. And that's what Saul was going to be doing. So that's what they decided to do to him. And word of this filters through the community and it reaches the believers there in the church at Damascus. And they come to the aid of their new member. And they did everything they could do to assist him and to protect him. Verse 24 says that the enemies were watching the gate of the city around the clock hoping to catch Saul. See, here's how this works. He's in the city of Damascus. It's an old city. By the way, in, in Damascus, in the country of Syria today, some of the old city walls still exist. There's a section of wall that tradition says is the section of wall through which Saul was lowered in this basket that supposedly still stands today at Damascus. Um, so you had the wall around the city, and it's a great wall. These, these cities had, or sometimes the walls were big enough, you could run a chariot around the top of the wall. Great walls, people would build houses uh, in and, or up against the wall, and so there might be a window through the wall. And this is what happened. The followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. I love this. Listen, this is a reminder that when, when new people come into the church, it's not without challenge. Right? One of my mentors used to tell me, John, just be aware, ministry is messy. Ministry is messy because people are messy. They have lives and, and, and they intersect with other messy people and it's just it's just messy. And it is. Like, our lives are not as clean and neat and tidy as we would like or think they ought to be. Somebody who is new to the faith or new to the church, theirs is certainly not going to be. And that was true of Saul. This church faced some challenges because of this. New people need our help as they begin their walk with the Lord. A um, couple of things they remind us in this text that 
that we have to be flexible to serve people. Now, I, I, I would imagine that, um, in, in my mind, they're going to kill Saul. Okay, what are we going to do? Okay, let's see. Oh, I know what. I, brother such and such lives on the wall. He's got a big hole in the wall. There's a window. Okay, okay what are we going to do with this? Okay, we've got a plan starting to develop. Oh, wait a minute. I, I've got this big basket. We can use a basket. And, and Ananias has a big piece of rope. I know he has a rope. I, I saw the rope. So, and so they con concoct this plan, right? Now, I, there's probably somebody in this church who said, I don't know, that sounds pretty shady. I mean, do we really want to be the church that hauls people out of town in a basket with a rope through the wall? I mean, is that who we're going to be? Is that is that what it means to be the church? Right? I mean, I, or, 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 you know, we, we've had to help one another before. We've helped with money and we've helped with food and we've helped with logic. We've never really had to help in a murder plot. And I don't, is this, do we want to get into this? Is that really a church thing or should we get a lawyer for this? Right? I mean, I suspect that there's somebody said, you know, that's not the way this church operates. We've never done that at our church. We're gonna we have to be flexible as we assist new people along their journey. That means sometimes that you know the floor gets dirty, or the room gets rearranged. We help with food, we send them to our pantry. We make contacts for them on, on their behalf to try and put resources together. We spend time in conversation doing discipleship work. They don't know the word yet. We've got to help teach them. I mean, it's, it requires all those things. We have to be flexible to make all of that happen. They didn't just teach us that we have to be flexible to serve uh, folks who are new to the church. We often also have to be faithful to support them. Think about the ones um, as, as this, members of this church are lowering Saul down the side of this wall with a rope. I don't know how many people are up there with a, a grip on the rope. But what if they weren't there? What if there's what if Saul comes up with a great plan to get out of town, but, but there's nobody to hold the rope? Or what, or what if they start holding the rope, but then they decide this is just way too much effort? And they just let go. I'm out. Or, or this man that they're lowering in the basket, he went on to write 13 books of the New Testament. He carried the gospel into new regions around the world. He was responsible for the planning of who knows how many churches. We, we just know about a, a fraction of them, I would guess. But at this very moment, at this moment, he was absolutely wholly and completely dependent on the support of these unknown church members <laughs> on the other end of the road. Now, I don't know that there are any potential Pauls in the room, right? Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. By the way, Paul was a full-grown adult, right? He wasn't, um, he, he didn't come up, you know, as an answer to call to preach at the age of 12, and right? I mean, he, he was a grown man who came to the Lord and entered ministry. I don't know if we have any future or potential Pauls in this room. But but who knows? There may be one who is or comes to us who is completely dependent on us early on for their support. Spiritually, materially, something. We have to hold the rope for the new ones. We have to support them. We have to pray for them. We encourage them. Has anybody heard of a guy, uh, 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 there was an old preacher, his name was Guy Marlowe. Anybody heard of Guy Marlowe? No, I didn't think he had. It's because he's virtually unknown. He's a real character. Guy Marlowe, he was the pastor of a church in West Palm Beach, Florida, Northwood Baptist Church. There was a young man who grew up under the ministry of Pastor Marlowe, who, who describes Marlowe as being influential in helping him respond to the call of God on his life. Here's how he described it. Pastor Marlowe. He said, Don Marlowe, a uh, guy Marlowe was a man who invested his life in the lives of his flock and took an interest in teenagers. Marlowe invited teenagers to participate in ministry. It's pretty, pretty important stuff. 
here's why this is important. Um, you probably don't know who Guy Marlowe is, but you probably uh, do know who the young man who praised Pastor Marlowe is. That young man who was so influenced by Guy Marlowe was the late Dr. Adrian Rogers, who was president of the Southern Baptist Convention at one point, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church, at one point one of the largest churches in America, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. He's a wonderful preacher, great man. Countless people brought under the message of the gospel through his work. All because of an unknown pastor of a church in Florida. I don't, know who, I don't know who Paul among us might be. There might be a guy Marlowe among us, though. Right? We all have a role in bringing people into the kingdom and into the local church. New people around us need us. They need our support. We cannot allow them to fall victim to the enemy who would destroy them and destroy their future. Listen, churches are not meant to be gated communities. We're not meant to be uh, places where just the, the most perfect come and hide themselves from a society around them that is, that is sinful and sick. Churches are meant to be homes with open doors where people who are new to faith, new to the church, and new to the gospel, people who are redeemed by God's grace can be accepted into the family and put into the ministry and poked along in their journey. And listen, I pray by God's grace that we would be that, that we would learn from this church at Damascus, that we would demonstrate to you, Jesus, we are called to the law. We pray to you. As you bow your heads and close your eyes, we're going to conclude in a moment with a song. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing another song. But as we do, we're prepared to do that. I want to give you a chance to respond. And, and I don't know what it is that might have spoken to you, the Lord may have used, whether it's you're a seasoned, more mature believer who who says, yes, I, I want to be able to actively seek out people to bring in and, and do this, to bring in and make them part of the church and give them a ministry, give them a role. Give them a place to serve. Encourage them. Teach them. Maybe, maybe you are a less mature believer who says, that's what I want. I want to be part. I want to be engaged. I want, I've got this burden to do this thing. Maybe you've never actually trusted in Jesus and you want to do that. We would love for you to do that and then to make you part of the church for the ministry and support from this body of believers. When we sing here in a minute, I'm going to make my way to the back. If you'd like to pray, I'd love for you to come back and meet me. And we'll spend a few minutes talking to Jesus about whatever it is that's on your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this example of this church in Damascus that had reached out and took in Saul of Tarsus as a new believer and brought him into the church, allowed him to have a ministry, and supported him. Help us to do that. Help us as you bring people our way or as we seek out people in the community, help us to bring them in, to give them a ministry, to support them encourage them to be there. Lord, if there's anybody here today that needs to spend a few minutes in prayer, I pray that they would meet me at the back and that we would do that. That you would speak and that you would move. We love you and trust you for it. Ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I knew he was going to be a good one. I knew he was going to be a good one. I knew he was going to be a good one.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.